and we're live. Hello, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to another episode of A Branch of Laurels. Uh, my name is Ashexi. I am a member of the Order of the Laurel from Ontier. And tonight, my guest is Marion Starveld. She is a Baroness, Viscountess, and Laurel <laughs> from the Principality of the Summits, um, which is uh, basically Southern Oregon or mid to most of Oregon. <laughs> yeah, these days we sort of gobbled up part of the, the middle that <laughs> didn't start out there. It's about Salem down, right? It is Salem down now. Yeah, it used to be Eugene down. Yeah, so, um, so that's awesome. Welcome. Thank you for doing this with me tonight. Thank you for doing it. I'm super excited. Um, you are part of the crew that my husband uh, grew up in the SCA with. And um, Raven went to high school with him, which means you also went to high school with him. I think we just missed because I'm two years older than Raven. Okay. Okay. Started like right after I left. She's never actually forgiven me for deserting her at high school. But <laughs> didn't really say, didn't really want to. <laughs> high school was not my favorite thing in the world. Yeah. No, me neither. Yeah, her picture and, and, and Optimus Adi's picture are side by side in your book. It's very cute. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah, because it's uh their their last names are so anyway, we won't say their last names on, on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, I'm totally off off uh, off script. Um so we usually start this by asking how you found the SCA and how you fell in love with it. I found the SCA uh probably in a similar way to a lot of people. I started high school and I was in the first group of people in Eugene that started high school in ninth grade. It was a three-year high school before that, it became a four-year high school. So the freshmen and sophomores were both new. Um, and I met a couple of people there that played D&D, which I'd never heard of because I was sort of raised at the top of an ivory tower and my knowledge of, of normal life was limited. <laughs> and I did not come from a public school before that. I had been in a, a little um, Montessori school for, for the equivalent of junior high, which I think had a total of 14 students. Wow. So I hit high school and Wah! there's this whole world out there. And there's these people that are playing games that, that let you pretend to be something else. And, and so I found that and I found a group called Starfleet that did essentially role playing game Star, Star Trek stuff at the same time and the uh the guy whose house the dnd game was at um was in the sca and so was his then girlfriend um most recent sca name is august wolf uh hasn't played in the sca for like 20 25 years or something like that but she decided that i would like the sca and so they got me my first dress and um, I went through rigorous full weekend training before I was allowed to go to my first SCA event. Wow. It was like how to walk up and down stairs without killing yourself in a long dress and all of that. It was actually kind of useful in a lot of ways. And then um, I went to an event that was actually a, a demo. It was a one day demo on the U of O campus. Uh, and that was really, really cool. And there were some really cool people, some really cute people. I was 16, you know? Uh, <laughs> so um, I, I went home burbling about it. And my mom at the time, I think, was in the middle of her second master's, which would have been in French history. Um, so she thought the fact that her teenager had gone to high school and found a group that pretended that, it, that history was happening was pretty keen. Um, so she actually, she and my dad kind of helped me go to a couple more events and, and I was hooked. I got to dress up in cool clothes and go pretend to be somebody completely different. And at 16, who doesn't want to be somebody else, you know? For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, so those people that mentored you at first, um, are, you said the woman is not around anymore. Is, is the, um, gentleman still around? No, he's not either. <laughs> he's the guy that, that you write a story about and nobody ever believes. So all the way through high school, we told him that he was so stinking smart, he was going to grow up to be a rocket scientist, and he did. Oh, wow. 
<laughs> he moved up to Seattle <laughs> and became a rocket scientist. That's pretty cool. But the, the sort of the next tier, the people that I met in the months following that first event are still around because they're my current household. Oh, so tell me so, about that. I met Ambrose and uh, now known as Master William, um, Elizabeth Piper, uh, Lindrail, um, who hasn't played in a long time either. She was a bard and um, she used a sling in wars. And to my knowledge, she's the only person in Ontario that's ever really done that, like hardcore. Um, and Ambrose. Very cool. I thought he was kind of cute. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you met him when you were 16 or 17? Somewhere around there, yeah, 16, 17. I, you know, obviously didn't hook up with him right away, but um, it, I like to say one of my um, skills in life is shopping. <laughs> so I kind of saw what I wanted on the shelf and waited till uh, the time was right. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never done that, so you know. That's amazing. Um, so what were you into when you first started playing? Um, when I, you know, the first year or so, I wasn't sure. I was still trying to get to know people. I'm, I'm naturally a really shy person. It's very hard for me to get to know new people. And that's actually one of the things that the SCA has done for me is teach me how to interact with human beings because it, it's not a natural skill for me. Um, so yeah, the first year I was kind of like, you know, I was making myself garb and um, hanging out. Uh, Audientum has always been really big in group projects. So it's really easy to just kind of hang out and help with projects and not really have your own direction for a while. Um, so uh, some of the hangings that we still use today were, were, were painted back then. I wasn't allowed to paint on them yet because I hadn't been vetted as being able to color in the lines for fabric paint, but there were other things that I could help with. Um, and then uh, eventually I got really tired of eating cheese and bread and carrots with optional salt and sometimes butter. So I got into cooking in the SCA and I, I have sort of a, a secret um, past that made that much easier for me. <laughs> uh, the, my dad is an amazing cook. And so I grew up with him in the kitchen, but my mother was a um, graduate teaching fellow for a man named Madge, or, uh, Val Lorwin, whose wife was Madge Lorwin who wrote Dining with William Shakespeare, which was pretty much the, the first decent cookbook that showed both the original recipe, her redaction explanations to a certain extent of why her redaction was the way it was. So I grew up in her kitchen um, at a really formative time of my life. Wow. Yeah, it was a serious advantage. So, you know, I, I watched her, uh, she went to, um, the Tower of London where the library is, you know, at that point there was nothing online. There was no online. Yeah. <laughs> um, you managed to get um, his credentials, got her in there and they actually allowed her to take, you know, those old shiny Xeroxes? Um, she got Xerox copies of a bunch of honest to God medieval cookbooks. Like they handed her the real thing and let her take Xerox copies of them. Um, which she brought home and, and bound. And then she had to plant the garden to, to grow the food because this was long before Eugene had like import food available. You know, it was pretty much Safeway or taco time. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so she had to, to order seeds from all over the world and grow a lot of the things and, and then do the cookbook. Um, so. That's amazing. What, um... What possessed her to do that? How did she? It's it's just a random thing, I guess. She was always, I guess, very interested in cooking, and um, she was just as just as intellectual, if not more intellectual, than her husband was. But generation wise, um, and because she had the at that, she they were Jewish, and 
at the time that he got into academia, um, it was very hard as a woman to get into academia and it was very hard as a Jewish woman to do anything in this country. It, you know, it still can be a disadvantage in some, in some uh, geographical areas, in some uh, careers. But what it basically meant is that she helped him with his work, but she had her own interests. And so she decided at one point that, you know, she'd had it with him writing all the books. She was going to do her own. <laughs> That's awesome. Wow. Uh, so, so you started to make food like she did in the SCA. I did. What were some of the first things that you did? Um, oh boy. Well, of course I started with her book. So, and I still use it regularly. So I started baking all the bread that, that our household ate. Um, and for a long time before Raven and I took over the kitchen, uh, there was a period where everybody brought something and it was sort of pre-arranged. It was like a weekend long potluck. So one of the things that I could afford to bring as a teenager was bread because it's relatively cheap to make. Um, and I'd, I'd been, I grew up making bread. So that one was easy. And that kind of led me to discover how very few actual bread recipes there are. Um, and that has continued. I mean, obviously there's thousands of times more uh, information available now than there was in 80, <clears throat> whatever that was. <laughs> But we really haven't, we found more uh, archeological information. You can gather some information about bread from um, the laws about uh, what happens if your next door neighbor tromps across your grain fields, that kind of thing. Um, and some stories and, and poetry. But as far as actual like instructions, well, everybody knows how to make bread. You don't write that down, so. Right, right. The wow. bread tangent, which is really easy for me to do. <laughs> So as you took over the kitchen, um, did that sort of lead you into kind of a cyclical routine with events and growing seasons and, and food? Yeah, yeah, it really did. I was, I was raised in a household that had an almost um, depression era concept of waste. So I, you know, I had already grown up with you eat the chicken and then you use the bones and then you use the broth and then, you know, going on like that. And in fact, actually a couple of years before I was in the SCA, my dad had a one year sabbatical replacement in North Dakota and my mom and I didn't go with him. Um, and we would have these contests of like, which one of us could make a chicken last longer, that kind of thing. Plus we were always poor. They were grad students or, you know, just starting their careers. Um, so that, that kind of came with me and um, when I started college, I was beyond poor. Uh, there were times when like, I, I would go to college and then I, I worked in group homes in, in the evening. And if we were making mashed potatoes to the group home, I brought home the potato peels because that was a source of food for us. Um, so that naturally lends itself to a very medieval style of eating and cooking and thinking about food because you know, 99% of, of the people in the Middle Ages did not waste food. There was no, I want to eat this and therefore that's what I'm going to go get. It was what's available, not knocked down, not, not uh, nailed down, not illegal, or at least they won't catch me, uh, <laughs> you know? And that because you're eating what's available, it's very tied into the seasons. And then if you want it to go beyond seasons, you learn how to preserve it. And, and suddenly you're making cookies for Eggles and it's January. <laughs> <laughs> well, you put together some kind of photographs of what different seasons of cooking look like. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm realizing that I need to go and fix, sorry. It's uh, the wrong window is up. So let me fix that. And then I will screen share. Yeah, I can, I can matter about food forever. Although interestingly enough, food is not, well, it was a component of what I was learning. 
it's not everything. Yeah, it's pretty much the only thing I can still do now physically, but. Okay, so we'll start with spring. Okay. Right, where do you want to, is spring a good, a good season to start with? Spring is fine. Okay. So, Eggles for me is a 12 month experience in normal times. Um, I have to say my entire life, including my mundane life has been really altered by the fact that Eggles has not been happening. Um, but so we will start, this is a soup pot at Eggles. Um, and this soup pot is the meal for that event, but it can also be looked at as the initial stage of the Eggles for the next year after that. Uh, I think that's probably lamb stew, I see lemons. <laughs> Maybe chicken. <laughs> Um, so this is, uh, this is lunch at Eggles. I think this is one of the Roman lunches. And one of the things I love, love actually doing is having kids in my kitchen. I love having a kitchen full of people. I know a lot of cooks are like, you know, once they start the, the serious cooking, they close the door and, and they don't want to be interrupted. But as many people as I can stuff in my kitchen, um, makes me happy. And these two have been for the last few Eggles, um, part of my kitchen crew. They, in fact, these two little girls uh, fetch all of the water for my family. Wow, that's Great. wonderful. Well, I have a 12 year old that um, would love to come spend time in your kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is pie. This looks like it's mostly various types of egg pie. Um, probably also for Eggles. The crusts for these, however, would have been made back in January. And the eggs might have been bought in the fall or the winter because when eggs go on sale or one of my friends has a bunch of chickens that are overlaying, uh, we freeze like gallon containers of scrambled eggs that get used later. Wow. <laughs> I know it. Uh, so Vesta and I have birthdays that are both, we're right before Eggles, which means that my entire adult life, I haven't really had birthday parties or anything because I'm always loading, loading boxes and stuff for Eggles. Uh, Vesta's favorite food, as far as I know on the planet, is, is uh, baklava. So although baklava as we know it, uh, I can't document. Doesn't mean it's not period, but I haven't been able to document it. Um, we make a fair amount of it for Eggles every year. It is one thing that although it's shelf stable for a significant amount of time is not usually made out of time because it gets really soggy if you try to freeze it. Yeah. And the, the tin, tin pans that you see there are, are a recent concession to my growing age and decrepitude. <laughs> uh, because we just can't carry the amount of ceramic that I used to take to the lights. Mm. Ah, okay. So cookies. So this would be early spring, probably March or so, where we start ramping up cookie production. My encampment will go through about 300 pounds of cookies um, in the course of the three and a half days of bagels. And we try not to buy any. There's one commercial cookie that we buy just because we can get into that later. It's it's one of those things that, that we make into s'mores on site. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to point at the screen and of course that doesn't work for you guys but um the the Ziploc bags that you see there are two gallon bags and that tin the, the bottom layer of tin is a full full steamer tray so um wow yeah it's a fair number of cookies and there's a lot more in the kitchen <laughs> that's amazing Ah, pickled eggs. Pickled eggs is one of the things that is an actual period way of preserving food and making it last longer. Um, in this case, the sort of Americans are really familiar with the beet pickled eggs. Um, it's a way of using brine once you fish the vegetables out of it, and it's a way of preserving protein. Um, so that's beet pickled eggs and Kalamata olive and um, beans. Uh, beans used to be in that that last one, and of course now it's eggs. So pickled bean juice. Wow. Mm. Shortbread. Lots and lots of shortbread. Possibly more than 300 pounds of cookies. I'm not actually sure. <laughs> so, 
canning obviously is not period. Um, they did a lot of fermented food that would have a, a similar effect if a slightly different um, taste. I'm not as comfortable with that um, because I'm feeding, depending on the egg, you know, the, the basic encampment is about 40 people. And then when we do things like um, uh, weddings or, or whatever, we, we tend to host fairly large parties of several hundred people at Eggles. Um, I, I compromised by going with FDA rules. Um, to my knowledge, I've never given anybody um, food poisoning. I'd like to keep it that way. So you kind of have to balance. Like there is a period food, there is a period cooking technique. Um, asparagus, uh, and this would have been February, March when asparagus is, is um, in season, um, was really, really, really cheap that year. So I pickled a bunch of it. And that's a lot of how our food choices are made is um, is it something I can glean? Is it something in the barony that is going for free that people are just willing to drop off on my porch? Is it something I can get for 50 cents a pound or less? Wow. Oh, cheese. This is a little out of order, but that's okay. Um, we do make a, a fair amount of the cheese that we take to events. Uh, this looks like it's probably fresh goat cheese and olive oil. And then once again, that's a way of preserving it. So um, when the goat cheese goes on sale, which I have, I have this one Albertsons, it's in a neighborhood where nobody drinks goat milk, right? So I used to work right across the parking lot from it and I would check it every day. And I had a reminder on my phone for what day the goat milk was gonna post date. And I had them pretty well trained to sell me quarts of goat milk for like 50 cents or a buck. And I would fill my cart with whatever they had and bring it home and make cheese. I don't have that job anymore. So it's gonna be a little bit more expensive <laughs> if I ever do this again. But um, so you make fresh cheese when the milk's available. Um, and then I would refrigerate it usually in the oil, but it means that once we get to site, it doesn't need to be refrigerated for the, for the course of the weekend. Um, this is the, probably the same type of fresh cheese that's been um, smoked and dipped in wax. And um, once again, that, that's actually a period way of, of preserving food. Um, and it would just get stored in the basement until time for the event. Oh, <laughs> that's before it gets dipped. <laughs> More cheese. I sent you a lot of pictures of cheese. Oh, the bay leaves are out of my yard though. Those are kind of fun. That's really cool. More cheese. Um, yeah, more, more wax dip cheese. Um, and once again, this cheese is commercially made cheese that I've, I processed, um, actually with Riga years, decades, long time ago, taught us how to do this, of taking commercially made cheese, running it through a meat grinder because that breaks down the, um, the, the structure of the cheese, turns it basically into something that's Play-Doh textured and that lets you mix in herbs or flavoring or whatever. And then you pack it into a, pack it in layers like orange cheese, white cheese, orange cheese um, into a, a spring form pan, pan and refrigerate it overnight and it reforms into a solid cheese. And then you, you have what's sold at the store for like, you know, 15 bucks a pound, but you got it for three bucks a pound. Wow. And there's, there it is. Yeah. So once again, that happens when the cheese is on sale. <laughs> Lamb. Wow. Um, so that same that same Albertsons, uh, most people don't buy lamb in that neighborhood. And I had the butcher trained for a very long time to um, sell me the, the one day before post date lamb for incredibly cheap. So you know, once again, with the cycle of life, when, when the lambs are, are being slaughtered, they're cheap. And if nobody buys them, they're even cheaper. And so you process them and, you know, in period, I might've dried it or um, fermented it or pickled it. Um, I have the luxury of having a freezer. So I do that. Oh, bay leaves. <laughs> and this is a dehydrator? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, dehydration is a perfectly period way of storing food. Um, once again, I, I like to be able to control it to the point that I know it's safe. Now leaves, you know, nothing's going to really happen if you just hang it. But, um, so 
this is a really good example of the things that were dirt cheap at a really bad time of the year for what I wanted to do with them. So there's the goat milk. And this is probably February, March, something like that. Pine nuts of all things showed up that year for like two bucks a bag. Wow. Yeah. And they're like half pound bags. And dates were really, really on sale. So, you know, obviously we were going to have to go roaming for the food <laughs> that year. <laughs> you know. Oh. Pies get made months in advance, usually for items. So these are, other than the one that we've clearly eaten half of, on their way to the freezer. Okay. So that was spring. Mm -hmm. and, and the way not... means that we never know what we're eating for eggles until basically the month before but we're cooking for 12 months a year come on summer okay yeah there's not as much summer <laughs> so the pickled eggs that go to, to eggles sometimes i have leftovers they come home they go back in the refrigerator this is what they look like after about a month in the pickling liquid they're still food <laughs> wow this is when the pickled beans happen and I, I think at least once pickled beans were were declared legal tender in, in summits and i'm not even the one that declared them to be so um <laughs> but you know beans are a seasonal thing um so they happen when that season happens and i usually do about 100 pounds of beans at a time when i'm pickling them and and you have sort of an army of people that that help you Yes, actually, I should make that very clear. I sure as heck do not do all of this by myself. There is very little of what I do in the SCA that can be that I could do as a, a an individual without um, a lot of help. I have um, Raven, obviously, because she lives with me, and um, the last ten or ten or twelve years, uh, Moira has been part of my cooking crew and Truchin who doesn't actually play in the SCA anymore, but she's behind the scenes helping me play in the SCA. <laughs> um, this would be one of those batches of eggs. So that's summer. And I've got a five, that's a five gallon bowl. That's one of my bread bowls full of eggs because that's the season where, where the friends that I have that have chickens are producing a ton of eggs. Yep. So, um, they're dirty when I buy them. Um, and I store them that way because you can store dirty eggs on the countertop for months. Uh, <laughs> but you wash them before you crack them because you don't really want, well, chicken shit in your food. Yeah. Uh, so they're being washed on their way to being cracked, scrambled, and frozen for that thing that you saw 10 months later. <laughs> Just amazing. All right. So where is fall here? Let's see. Sorry, I am not super good at navigating. Oh, it's not wanting to do the thing. Um, let's see. Nope. I'm not seeing the fall and I know there was one. Oh wait, there it is. It's all alphabetical. <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> Yeah, we talked earlier before we started the interview. I had four hours of sleep last night, so I'm a little slow, folks. I apologize. These are beautiful. Those are meat pies. Um, and uh, when I when I do feasts, I really like doing harvest feasts. I really, really like doing harvest feasts because you can do them almost for free. Um, the, well, in Adiantum, you can. It's not possible in a lot of places, but Adiantum is in this great area where almost any food that you can possibly think of is grown within 50 miles of my house. Um, and a lot of people have fruit trees and stuff in their yards where they're not processing the fruit. So the, over the last 30 years or whatever, the barony has gotten very used to me sending out a notification like, okay, we're doing midwinter's feast or we're doing the, the fall feast it used to be Amergans and, um, and so, you know, whatever you got, bring it to me. And we start those feasts a year in advance as well. So Eggles is a full year cycle for me, but so is a feast. I'm not happy doing a feast unless I know about it 12 months in advance, because then um, both in my yard and all over the barony, I can say things like, you know, 
plant me some extra of this herb or that fruit or, you know, um, bring me all of your extra quince, that kind of stuff. So for 12 months, I will get home and there will be random bags of produce on my, on my porch and I process them and they get served with the feast. So the last feast that I was actually part of, I did uh, barren apple and we fed, we were significantly under budget, but it's because of the people, you know, they, they bring me stuff. They help me process stuff. Um, I, I could not do that without a population that, that participates in that whole experience. It's amazing. So here's part of the cyclic thing. So um, all of that lamb that was processed uh, produces um, produces bones, right? So in this case, I think it's lamb again. Yeah. In this case, for some reason, um, there was leftover lamb. I think at a, at one of the butchers had this major sale. So we got a bunch of lamb, processed out the meat for use at, at the next, um, I don't know if it was a feast or, or eggles. And then the bones get roasted and made into broth and, and we use all of that. One, one thing about the way my brain works, I have, to, I have to warn people, I don't necessarily remember things in separate years. So eggles is all one big event for me. It's just lasted for 30 years. And Midwinter's is all one big event and Twelfth Night is all one big event. So, you know, <laughs> you know that feeling when you get to a site, you're like, oh, okay, we just, you know, we were just here not long ago. Well, it was 12 months ago, but you know, it's still the same event. I get that. And these look like pears? They are pears. There's uh, many versions of this medieval recipe for, for stewing pears in spiced wine. Um, it, if you run it through the FDA canning calculator, it works just fine. So it's a completely medieval um, process. It's just that the canning part is not something that they have the technology for. So, um, quince based. Oh, wow. Quinces are amazing. I love quinces. And mundane people don't want quinces. They don't want to process them. And all over Lane County, there are quince trees. So, <laughs> They are perfectly happy for you to go pick their quinces and haul them off for them because it, honest to God, takes an ax to get into the suckers. Um, they are very difficult to process, but they're so worth it. So worth it. We have a quince tree in our, in our neighborhood that just the fruit just rots on the ground every year. Oh. Nobody, nobody uses it at all. And no. I don't know what to do with it. Every year I'm really tempted. Um, you can do anything with the quince that you would do with an apple. It's cool. You can't eat it raw. Well, you can, but it's not pleasant. <laughs> it's, um, do you ever use plantains? No. Okay. Plantains and quinces are sort of equivalent. They're the, the rock hard, you must cook this version of their food group. So quinces are that version of an apple pear. Plantains are that version of a banana. I, I feel like I need to come and like spend a year with you and, and, and learn everything. <laughs> I just like to eat, man, you know? <laughs> so Pliny's quince refers to the oldest known preserves recipe, which is quince, honey, and black pepper, um, put up in little pots. Um, and it's amazing. It's not a combination I would have thought of. No. It's, it's so good. So I make that one for like gifts within the SCA and serving at feasts and that kind of stuff. Uh, quince cranberry is, is a marvelous combination, uh, but it's not particularly buried, but that's what we make for Thanksgiving. So, so that's sort of, it shows you, you know, on the, on the left side is pure, pure SCA, and then it goes into sort of that middle ground of a medieval cook would not simply copy what her mother had done if she moved to another country. She would have used the same thought process and incorporated the foods that she found where she lived, right? Right. So, um, cranberries don't grow in the right place for the SCA, but they grow where I live mundanely. 
and I know how to use quince. So the combination makes sense both to me as a mundane cook and as a medieval cook. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, the, the um, people native to our lands would have been using the cranberries for sure. Absolutely. And using them with crab apples, which are very similar to quince, just smaller. They're hard. They're very pectiny. Um, they're amazing as an ingredient. <laughs> um, and they make a really good combination with cranberries. Wow. But I have a whole soapbox about art in the SCA. You start by imitating art in the SCA and then you develop what you as that person would actually have done. Well, I, I don't live in Utrecht. Um, I live in Ontier and what foods grow here, how do I as, as a woman from Utrecht treat those foods? That's sort of next step because despite um, what mundane history books will tell you, people in the Middle Ages moved all the time. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Uh, so this would be another prep thing for Eggles. This is, um, there's a lot of plum trees in, in Eugene as well. So we had made, I remember this year specifically, we had made plum pies for the feast, hundreds and hundreds of plum pies for the feast. Um, but there are, they're clingstone, you know, they don't come free. So mm -hmm. to process that many plums, what you end up doing is just cutting the cheeks off and using those, especially when you have, you know, a hundred pounds of free plums. And that leaves you with that little circle of plum in a pit and a lot of vodka and you can solve that problem. Oh, there you go. <laughs> nice. Wow. So. And, and again, these are two gallon bags, right? Yeah. Wow. And that's all food that's donated by people in the barony, by people in surrounding areas for feasts or just because they want it to get used so they know I can or or preserve or whatever and, and do you have like several chest freezers because this is feeling like more than one chest freezer worth of food I'm someday my chest freezer is going to die and I'm going to be so sad we got this chest freezer for free it was sitting by the side of a road with free works on it 30 years ago it is this ginormous commercial outdoor chest freezer you know the kind that that like when you were a kid and you went down to the the one store in in some little town and there was like the big freezer outside that had the ice cream and the you know whatever all in it so we tested it one time you can get well three full-grown adults or two middle-aged adults into that freezer <laughs> it's big <laughs> <laughs> wow and wow. you know it's more energy efficient if it's full so for sure oh so this is moira she's a these days a great deal well the last 10 years or so a great deal of why i i can cook as much as i do um we were prepping for baron apple because she was one of my co-feast co people um well actually she and i did the dinner um her uncle owns a bunch of property that has what used to be an apple orchard on it so there's like 20 different kinds of apples and he doesn't, you know, he makes cider for his family, but that's about it. So he let us go spend the day picking um, apples and using his cider press. So for Baron Apple, all of the, um, I don't know, probably 50 or 60 gallons of, of uh, apple cider that we had at that event were um, donated. Wow. And hand pressed by you. Yep. We had so much fun. That's amazing. All right. So now we're going to go to winter. There it is. <laughs> Come on, computer. Flash before my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, my mundane household has one major party every year, and it's for New Year's, and it's our cookie party. So it's when we do Christmas cookies, but not for Christmas and not necessarily all Christmas style cookies, but we have a cookie party for New Year's. Everybody in the Barony comes, all of our friends come. Um, and 
So we're making cookies anyway. So a lot of the cookies for Eggles get made at that time because it's just more efficient. Um, so cream cheese and rye anise um, and goat cheese herb made with lard because we have people in our encampment that can't have any dairy, including butter. Um, they're both savory um, and they're both really good and they have a lot of high protein content. So one of the things that my household has always been really focused on is, is work contributing. Um, we're not real tolerant of people that just come to sit around all day. <laughs> There's work to be done because Verity's not big enough to have to have people that aren't going to contribute at least a little bit. So we run food three times a day out to the people that are on shift and having an easily consumable cookie like object that's not necessarily sweet because you're probably hot and you want salty and you need high protein along with that um, with that carbohydrate uh, is really popular. Nice. Wow. So one of the one of the ways that you can make a, a major name for yourself as a cook is just by getting the right getting the right cookie cutters. So <laughs> one of the things I was gifted with when I stepped up as Baroness was a two-headed bear cookie cutter. It's magic. You can make anything as long as it's two-headed bear shaped. People think it's amazing. I mean, I swear I could probably make little sawdust cookies and they'd eat it as long as it's that shape. <laughs> but um, those trays have Grail cookies on them for because that's the symbol of summits. Ah, whoops, Roman. So the Roman <laughs> say, these are uh, very phallic. <laughs> so I was getting ready for this Roman wedding. <laughs> and you know, you have to test things. This is one of the bread recipes that we do have. Um, it's a, a Roman bread recipe that includes a, a soft cheese. And there's various interpretations of what that soft cheese would be like. So of course we were trying them all to see which one we liked better. <laughs> and are those meatballs? Yeah, yeah, it was also one of the trial recipes. Um, for for that uh, the Roman wedding feast that was at Eggles that year. Um, another fun trick. So uh, most of us eat oranges. If you just save the orange peels and candy them, suddenly you have another product that would have been garbage before. Um, doesn't cost much to make them. It's really really easy. And if you cut little shapes out of the orange peel first then you have instant decorations for the rest of the year, which makes it really easy to like suddenly produce something that makes it look like you spent hours on it. And actually it was, you know, half an hour in a box cake and these orange peels that you made six months ago. Wow. So do you have like a spreadsheet that you keep track of all of these things or do you just have it in your brain? It's just how my brain is organized. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a spreadsheet. I just have a general feeling for how many pounds of cookies and how many pounds of meat we have. I have a spreadsheet for the people that I'm officially feeding at Eggles and what their likes, dislikes, and allergies are, whether they're working shifts, which jobs they're working, you know, that kind of stuff. But because the cycle has been ongoing until COVID, the cycle has been ongoing for 30 years no, it's not really written down anywhere. Um, wow. I, and you couldn't really write it down because it's so dependent on what's available, what's cheap, what shows up on the doorstep. Um, you know, I, you don't, I don't plan for what I want to make. I plan for what I have to cook with. So I would make the orange peel things and then store them somewhere and they would be out of sight and they would be out of mind and I would forget they were they existed. But they wouldn't be if they had been a component of your cooking for 30 years. You don't forget where your salt and pepper are. Oh, that's right. Cool. Okay. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it just becomes because it, it was a there's a slow build. It it's just my entire adult life had this system has built. Um so I haven't really had to necessarily plan it or think about it or write it down because it's been a very organically developing thing. Just amazing. So speaking of organically, mm -hmm. um, it turns out that if you hand press apple cider and then forget a couple of gallons of it on the front porch under the um, under the bench, it ferments. Huh. So that winter uh, found me bottling apple cider. 
<laughs> of a relatively alcoholic and busy nature. It's not bad. Just accidental cider, as you do. <laughs> well, that's how it was made in, in the Middle Ages. You know, the, the fermentation comes from the, um, the, uh, the name's gone, the, the stuff on the skin of the apples, right? Mm -hmm. um, the yeast on the skin of the apples, so. Wow. And then, you know, starting once again with the fresh cheese thing. It's, it's never ending. So um, this was part of the Silk Road feast. It was a midwinter's feast, an embarrassing number of years ago now. Uh, <laughs> but we, we did a feast, it was four removes starting in China and ending up in Elizabethan England. Um, and this shows some of the, the things that are kind of made over the course of the year and then how we set them up. We, we had a great site that year. Uh, it, it was big enough that we actually had an area the same size as the feast hall to do the, um, the setup in, the side of the kitchen. Yeah, so we had these huge tables, one table for each remove. And as things were done, we were able to to place them for serving. Um, wow. And then, you know, get them out of the kitchen, so. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, the, the bread was um, baked and frozen months before and all of the pie crusts were made and, and rolled and frozen months before, that kind of stuff, so that you don't kill yourself the week before the, the feast. Well, I mean, you do anyway, but not quite as badly. <laughs> I, say, um, I think you might be killing yourself, but okay. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's just like beautiful things all year. It makes it a lot easier when you get to that big thing, right? Your your short wow. hole or wow. So there we go. There's bread coming out of freezer bags, um, and that's that's Assault's um, library in her house. And we set out all of these tables so that we could thaw out all the bread and, and pies and stuff. <laughs> And the never ending cookies. It's really never ending. Cookies are, are a constant. Oh, those are beautiful. But it's the only way to make enough cookies for Eggles is to do, you know, cookies every few months. You gotta fill up a few two gallon bags. Oh, this was some of the bread for the Roman thing. Oh, <laughs> paleo s'mores. <laughs> so there's actually a Roman recipe for dates stuffed with cheese and wrapped in meat. Um, and then there's a modern thing that a lot of people refer to as paleo s'mores. That's either cream cheese or blue cheese in dates wrapped in bacon. Yes, Plus, please. <laughs> Plus um, but it's another thing. Bacon is usually on sale in the fall or winter. Um, so we will make you know, 20 pounds of them ahead of time, they freeze great. And that means that when it's time to pack for Eggles, um, you just have to take the boxes of them out of the freezer and put them in a cooler. And then we have this little fire bowl that I think it was developed for um, Sharon Rose's Roman wedding. Yeah, and then I used it again for Vesta's um, uh, Laureling Vigil and Party. Um, I found this metal bowl that I can I can make a charcoal fire in on the table so people can roast their own little <laughs> little snackies it's interactive food people love interactive food including me obviously yes wow oh <laughs> so this is backwards I and that's my fault I, I must have put it in backwards so one of the reasons that I can do all of this is that I live in a house that was built in 1920 and it has um, a canning pantry in the basement except for it turned out not to be big enough. So um, <laughs> I had to, I had to take over another, another section. And these are those, um, you know, those black plastic shelves that are five feet long. Yep. So there's, there's three of those. They're five feet long by, you know, two or three shelves high. This is officially the empties area for empty um, jars, but there's a time of the year where there's a lot more full than empty. So everything shifts constantly. And, and that's part of that sort of tidal nature of food in my life is that I start out, you know, maybe in the spring, we've emptied a lot of the jars. And so the shelves that you see here will be all empty jars. Um, 
and then by winter at the end of of heavy canning season those empties have been filled with food and so the there's a constant shifting um to make room because i don't i don't have space in the basement for empty shelves so right. if the apple butter needs to move over because i've used all of the canned pears then it moves over so that there's more room for the beans so that there's more room you know it's it's a constant <laughs> constant and it's a good way to make sure everything gets used too, right? Yeah. yeah, that too. And and there's a cycle to that too. You know, the first year that a fruit is in a in a jar, it's more empties. I thought I got rid of that picture. Oh well. Um, so this would be um, one shot. This is about half of the the shelving unit that's the full jars. Um, and that's from the other end. So those shelves were all there when I bought the house. Um, but yeah, there, there is a, there's a timeline shift to the canned goods as well. You know, the first year or two that a, that a pear is in a jar, that's the way it's eaten. And then by the third year where probably the texture is getting a little softer, um, it'll either get turned into sauce and made into cake or um, chopped up and, and served over ice cream or turned into sauce and turned into fruit leather. Wow. And then the fruit leather might get chopped up and used as the fruit pieces in, in bread. Um, the bread, the last of it may be turned into bread pudding. Um, bread pudding at the very end, you can add a little bit more cream, um, blenderize it and turn it into a custard sauce. So you just, you keep going. You don't waste things if you don't have to, especially when you put that much work into them. You know? Seriously. I just, Wow, I'm just, wow. I'll tell you the best cream sauce I ever made, which was an act of sheer desperation, was um, I had leftover spanakopita, like two pieces of leftover spanakopita. And I needed a cream soup to serve for lunch. And blenderized spanakopita makes the best base for a cream soup ever. <laughs> wow. So my family struggles with like trying to figure out what to cook for dinner <laughs> so i'm i'm looking at this and i'm like holy cow i don't know how you're doing this okay so the truth is if i'm cooking for myself i eat craft mac and cheese my whole thing about cooking i mean yes i love to cook i love to do this but it's not really about the food because what truly is my love of doing things in the SCA is creating an experience for other people. And one of the easiest ways to do that is with food. Um, but yeah, cook for myself. I'm eating a yogurt, cook for 300 people. I'm working for 12 months and scenting the air. That's just, you know, it's, it's doing it for other people that makes me happy and doing it with other people. I don't like working on projects by myself. I like having, you know, people in the kitchen. I like having Trudy and Moira and, you know, whoever all else. Um, and there've been many, many people over the years that, that have made it possible for me to do this because physically I cannot do this. I have, um, I have a degenerative spinal disease. I have degenerative um, uh, joints and I have an autoimmune disease. I can't do this stuff by myself. Wow, so, wow, wow, wow. Which was actually, in the end, the argument that got me to accept being a moral. Well, tell me about that. Um, you've, you've talked about uh, the food, but that's not really what you got your laurel for. So what was your path to laurel like? So I didn't really have one. <laughs> um, when, I, when I got into the SCA enough to, to start knowing people and things, there were a few people that I'd met that were laurels that were cool and Quite a few who'd been uh, really rude and mean, and I didn't really ever want to interact with again. Um, and so I didn't have the best opinion of, of peers in general, actually, <laughs> for a long time. Um, and then, you know, everything, everything ebbs and wanes. Um, people realized that they needed to learn how to do constructive criticism. And so there were some classes about that, I think at the minimum level, 
And so people got a little bit nicer and I got more involved with the nuts and bolts of the SCA. Um, I became, before we were a principality, um, uh, Ambrose and I were, um, oh, what were they calling it that year? Hold on, I have it written down. <laughs> uh, we were high chief and lady of the summits for 13 months. And that was sort of the proto principality position. And that got me more into, you know, knowing, knowing how things worked and meeting people. And, you know, I still, being a Laurel was not really on my radar. Um, and Raven was Laurels. And that was actually really cool. Uh, and more and more of the Laurels were getting to be kind of cool people instead of crabby. <laughs> um, and it, part of it probably also was me learning to interact with people better because I really, I'm, I am so painfully shy <laughs> naturally that, that there was a lot of that involved too. Um, so I, I wasn't really thinking about being a Laurel. I was just doing things that either needed to be done because we needed to eat or doing things that I enjoyed and made me happy. And I was raised by a reference librarian and a philosophy professor. So research was just kind of, you ask the wrong question at the dinner table and you're writing a paper. Um, so that was just sort of natural. And then um, I had just been, uh, I had just stepped up as Baroness actually in September. And then at May Crown, I'm staring down my first Eggles as Baroness. And I have to say it, that Adiatum is small. And so our, our Baronage has always been a very working position. Um, and Eggles for the Baron and Baroness physically is usually seven days because they're out there on site days before the event starts. And they're usually there days after the event ends. But May Crown was for once in the summits. Oh my God. So we had to go. And we went and we were looking at the schedule of, you know, leaving May Crown on Sunday and being on site for Eggles by Wednesday. And so I was really focused on that. And I got called up in court. And my immediate thought was, why would I want to do that? <laughs> I'm busy. <laughs> I don't like a lot of the people on that council. I don't think, well, maybe I just don't know them, but I don't know about this. And um, so a bunch of people sat me down and, and we really thought about that and talked about it a lot that night. It was, you know, Saturday night at May Crown. And at that time, vigils and things were not normal for laurels. So the fact that I even sort of I mostly kind of gone okay, Eggles <laughs> in court um, was unusual, but it gave people a chance to talk to me and for me to really figure out what I thought of it. And a lot of the decision making process or, or discussion was, well, yeah, you're cool. You do the art, you do the, the research. We think you're one of us. And if you don't take it, or if you don't accept this recognition, what does that say about all of the people that have helped you get here? Because none of the art forms that you do are solo. Blink, blink. <laughs> well, quad. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, so yeah, it wasn't so much a path to a Laurel as um, I wasn't watching traffic. Uh, it happened. It happened. Yeah, I, I was never an apprentice. Um, and at the time, there was more of a feeling of not necessarily having to be like PhD level in one thing, but there was there was something that was more thought of as like a household laurel, which goes in and out of fashion, I have to say. One of the things that I've really learned over the years is that uh, the SCA's philosophy of what things should be changes just as much as any other groups does. So um, at the time, I was still able to do um, production weaving of fabric and ceramics, um, which I can't physically do anymore. My shoulders just won't do that. But so there, there was more to it than cooking. But, you know, cooking is what people remember anyway. It's all about food. <laughs> I've never understood why people would go to the effort of like putting on armor and going to war to, to kill the enemy. All you have to do is poison them. They're done. OK, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. 
Well, that's really interesting. Um, I kind of had to go through that, that shift in how I thought about the council too before. And, and I was lucky enough to do that before I got offered. Um, I, the, a week is a really quick turnaround to wrap your brain around that and to really. Um, and I have to say, I don't really remember my laureling ceremony because I was in the middle of being Baroness. Of, the, it was my first year as Baroness of Eggles. And uh, I was busy. <laughs> <laughs> I was busy. My autocrat was two weeks from her due date. Um, yeah, there were a lot of things on my mind. But uh, it, it was amazing. I've, I've rarely regretted it. Um, and I luckily, I had a very patient king. Um, because it was the king that was on site for that, who put up with what I, what I, even then I knew that I was kind of pushing my luck with some of the things that I asked for in that ceremony. Um, what, what was special about your ceremony? I managed to survive intact walking up to the king of Ontario and saying, so your majesty, you know how it takes a night to make a night? Yes. I think it should take a laurel to make a laurel. So I need a laurel to be holding your hand when you do that. Oh. <laughs> and to give him absolute credit, he sort of cocked his head to one side and said, yeah. <laughs> so, who laureled you? Who was that? I, I'm going to refer to my notes again too, because I have his picture in my head, but I'm really bad at human names. Um, so, oh, it was Chorkill. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I knew that. I looked that up last night too, but <laughs> myself, so it makes me nervous and, and words go away. <laughs> no, I understand. And uh, names and faces, we've been away from everybody for, you know, yeah. a really long time. <laughs> so I did that and um, I, I told all of my brand new baby sergeants to bring swords to court if they had them. And uh, Duran at the time was the newest, youngest sergeant, and I called. I had him called up and used his sword in my ceremony, um, oh. which he will um, tell me to this day pretty much made him puke. <laughs> but <laughs> it may have been the first time he was ever called up in court. I'm not sure. It's like kingdom level court. I'm not sure. But <laughs> but I I wanted that symbology of of it taking. It taking a village to raise a peer. Yeah, that's that's really beautiful. I, I love that. Um, wow, that's really cool. Um, okay, so there we have more pictures of um, stuff. Stuff. So let's look at some of those. And um, yeah, I got to figure out how to get back to them. <laughs> What should I, we look at? I we could real quick go through that first feast thing, because it's sort of a indicative of of my um, my bizarre style of jumping off cliffs. Okay. So um, this is baby versions of me and Raven doing oh, our first oh. feast. Twelfth night used to have a feast um, back when Twelfth night was not Twelfth night con as it has become out of necessity. Um, and, you know, getting 200, 250 people at a 12th night was considered a pretty good turnout. Um, Isolt was autocratting. She was Baroness. And she had, she muttered something about maybe getting the feast catered because she just wasn't sure how she was going to handle that part. And of course, Raven and I said, <laughs> no, <laughs> but we'd never done a feast. We were both underage. Um, we couldn't drive. She, poor woman had to drive us to every store, farm, everything else that we needed for that feast. Um, you know, the biggest thing I'd ever cooked was like half of Thanksgiving dinner, or at that point, I think I'd cooked an Eggles or two for, for our household, but the household wasn't as big at that point. Um, so I think she's like 16 and I'm maybe 18. And um, we did a feast. Wow. And we met people at that feast that have been friends ever since. You know, Doug and Amy had just moved to Adiantum and Amy did dishes for 
um, for the first time for my feasts and she has done the dishes at every feast I have cooked ever since. And now she is unfortunately gone. So I think I have to stop cooking feasts, which I kind of need to do anyway, physically. Um, this was the menu. <laughs> which is kind of unreadable at this scale, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> we were making a purple cabbage dish and getting punchy. <laughs> so that's what happens when, you know, acid hits purple cabbage. Um, separating eggs. 13 dozen just doesn't even, that's not even enough for breakfast at Eggles anymore, but at the time it seemed amazingly huge. Yeah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think Assault was particularly amused by that. I, you know, she'd only ever seen the careful, you know, tip the egg back and forth in the, in the, the shell thing. And I was like cracking them into my hand and letting the white dribble out of my <laughs> Oh yes, yes. It definitely takes a level of maturity to do that kind of feast, absolutely. And climber, cl uh, counter climbing. Counter, well, <laughs> once again, we, I had made all the bread ahead of time and frozen it. And that was the only space in that kitchen to, to lay it all out, to thaw it out, because I hadn't picked up on the fact that maybe I should have gotten it out of, out of the freezer the day before. Uh, so this is all bread up here. Yeah, everything up there is, is bread. Wow. And chicken. This is a salt's kitchen. Um, you know, I, I stole, I think I, oh no, I lived in the dorms at that point. I didn't even have a kitchen. Wow. Yep. <laughs> so that was sort of our first experience with cooking for a lot of people. In a home kitchen. Wow. Well, you know, 90% of the food for a feast now gets cooked in a home kitchen. That's true. That's true. It's, I just, you know, I spread it out. Which is not to say that I turn up my nose in a nicely appointed commercial kitchen. No, no. <laughs> we like that. <laughs> so I think the other one that we should probably explore a little bit is the one called experiences. Uh, and there's there's also decorate all the stuff, which is just kind of fun. But <laughs> I don't even remember what year that was. Um, but it was raining so hard at that event that I was pretending to walk on water in my wooden shoes. And I think I was the only person on site with dry feet. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's the kind of experience, though, that sticks with you and makes you want to keep doing things in the SCA is just we all had this experience and maybe it wasn't the most fun at the time, you know, getting wet and rained on, but we pulled together as a group and you just get that feeling of camaraderie and family and we will, we will take care of each other and have fun in some stupid way at the same time. And, and who is this with you? I have no idea, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, baby pictures again. Hey, look who's in the background. So this is my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet at that point, but yeah. No, no. Um, and, Raven. and do you know who this is? Is this a person? Yeah, that, that was one of our, Ambrus and I had wards for a while there. Um, uh, yeah, Melissa, I can't remember her SCA name now, God. Uh, she's like long grown up and has a couple of kids now, I think. Um, wow. So does her little brother um but it, it's kind of the best of both worlds it's great you get to borrow other people's kids and then give them back <laughs> i love it Raven, uh, that was fiorly from the previous picture oh was it okay <laughs> um i think the the lion is sitting in the chair because the queen was there but not um not sitting with us at that point she might have been taking a break or something and this was Amergan's Revenge, and I, I really missed that event. It was the biggest bardic event in the known world uh, at the time. Maybe to this day, I have no idea. Um, yeah. And then after the first year of me doing that as Baroness, it turned into another excuse for me to do a feast because I love bardic, but it's really hard for me to sit and pay attention for 12 hours a day for two days, like, you know, focused and not have my face do something stupid that's going to freak out the, the poor people that are performing. Um, so I started doing the feast of that because it let me still 
hear the bardic and, and enjoy it, but not necessarily have to keep track of my face. Oh, so there's a, there's a subtlety to this picture. Um, this is stepping down as princess and Amoros is in the background prince. Um, and we had just put on, it's what I have on my head right now, but in my hand is the baronial circlet. And I love the shadow of the baronial circlet on the skirt um, because I was princess and baroness at the same time for both of my reigns. Oh, and wow. Having those two very different people in your head is a really interesting experience. Um, I don't think there's any other way of really ever understanding the difference between those two positions. And they are very different. Um, and I enjoyed both of them in very different ways. Um, but so that, that picture is sort of, I am about to turn around. I have the Viscounty hat on. I'm about to turn around. And when I get to the end of the, the court aisle, um, I switch back to the baronial circle because that's who I am at that point. Wow. And that's another experience that I can't think of any modern equivalent of. No, not at all. No. Oh, this is the view of our uh, Eggles encampment um, from the back of my kitchen. So that, that tent that we're in is the kitchen. And you can't really see, but if you look at the roof of the kitchen, and you can't see that the center is also painted white with patterning on it. And it's sort of, um, it, it's a, I have this philosophy that things should be decorative and useful. So it's a canvas tent, it's a dark canvas. And you would think that those stripes are just decorative, but what they actually do is at night, they reflect the lights in the kitchen down onto the work surfaces. Oh, that's so smart. Um, so they're, they're very purposefully white and very purposefully centered so that the lights that hang off of the, the um, horizontal poles reflect back down. Nice. Um, Miklos would like, to, uh, like me to ask you about the arguments between the Baroness and the Princess when you were in both roles. <laughs> oh, God, they had knocked down drag outs. It was amazing. Uh, <laughs> Partly because, um, possibly for my second reign, I don't remember now, but definitely for my first reign, Summits didn't have its own bank account yet. Audiencem held Summits' money, what there was of it. And so the princess had plans. She had things she wanted to do and she wanted to be able to, you know, pay for people's gas money to, to be able to get up north and be seen or go to classes or whatever. Um, and the Baroness was more like, yeah, that's not your money to spend, you can't do that. Sorry, try again. <laughs> um, and the, the different ways of dealing with pro you know, problems or issues that the two different people have to have. At the time, there was no term limits on being Baroness. For all I knew, I was, I was gonna be Baroness for 20 or 30 years. I was Baroness for seven and a half and I missed that job every day, but as princess, you don't have that kind of time. So if there's a problem, you need to you need to step on it really quickly, and be very, very um, reactive, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Baroness, you have time. You can you know your people very very well, and if you see something starting to kind of crop up or be a problem, you can kind of poke it, and then step back and see what happens. And then if that doesn't work, you poke it from a different direction. Um, and the princess would lose her patience with that. <laughs> It'd just be like, just fix it. I don't have time to pay attention to Adiantum as its own little squeaky wheel right now. And the barons would be like, yes, but that's my squeaky wheel back off. <laughs> um, so we really did. I mean, it sounds like a, a completely um, bizarre mental um, problem, but it, it, was, it was a really interesting experience. In some ways, it was really good because it meant that, for instance, um, for those two reigns, I didn't have to try to argue with the princess and what kind of timing she wanted in the Eggles court. Uh, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. But, uh, but yeah, they were, uh, they were versions of me, but not the same version. Interesting. So this looks like some sort of game at Eggles, maybe? This is Vesta and her, um, her cadre of fangirls. 
Aww. She, I don't think she'd been fighting all that awfully long. Um, but, you know, she was one of the, not one of the first female fighters, but one of the only. They're, they're still a minority. And all of the little girls in Summits and especially in Adiantum just thought and think that she was the bee's knees. And so somebody had gotten them all sort of like grouped together and they, they had like little chants. It was oh, great. Goodness, that's awesome. And she, she blushed plaid. It was, it was amazing. And that's another one of those things where my joy in the SCA comes from in some part making something like that possible. Not that it couldn't happen without me by any means, but if I can contribute to an atmosphere where that happens, then I have done my job. That facilitating other people's joy and experiences is, uh, yeah. it's so satisfying. It's the best. The sort of cruder way that I've put it is that my main um, artistic uh, raw material is not food, it's people. <laughs> because getting people together, like hearing that somebody loves to do something and knowing that you've got this other person over here that would make a really good combination and it's sort of yenting in a way, but, but not romantically necessarily. <laughs> so this is what the back end of a feast looks like. See all those boxes of canned goods? Do they look familiar? <laughs> wow. This was um, Baron Apple, which has this marvelous back porch off the back of the kitchen. So we were able to do a lot of the like sitting around um, doing prep work and stuff outside where it was cooler and not heat up the kitchen with all of it. Just especially since we were sharing the kitchen because Baron Apple has like somebody who does the breakfast and somebody who does the lunch and somebody who does the dinner. And then there's a whole nother crew that comes in for the next breakfast. And so you've got to kind of um, share that space and having that back porch was great. So <laughs> you'll note that Moira is in many of my pictures. Uh, and the tie dyed one, I think, is Alex. He doesn't really play anymore, unfortunately. Um, but one of the things that I've really enjoyed over the years is for, for many years, um, Adiantum has always made most of its own prizes and presents that it gives out. And we, I don't know how active it is right now, but, but um, there's a thing called Thing Makers because we made the things. We made the regalia things, we made the prizes for Eggles, we made the thank you gifts for the workers, all of that. And for a long time, um, I was in charge of that. It, I sort of had that job default for a lot of my tenure as Baroness. Um, and then when I stepped down, that was the thing that I took over because that was the, the thing that I wanted to make sure still I was involved in. So this was just, um, uh, it was like every two weeks for years, the Barony would come over to my house and make stuff. So binding books here. So we gave out uh, handbound books one year. And I, it's another one of those things. It's enabling. I love doing that. And here's a generational thing. I was a very small part of why Vesta is the amazing person that she is now. Um, you know, and now she has her own apprentice. And, and this is at that ceremony of her taking her first apprentice. Uh -huh. And I, I love that in some tiny, tiny way, I was part of what made that happen. It, it's, once again, not that it could not have happened or would not have happened without me, but the fact that I was able to contribute in some way to it is why I'm here. Right, I think that the stewardship of the SCA is, is, is kind of the main thing that peers should be, doing right and that's one of the things that um i think you were probably recognized for is because you were you you had already taken that role of a steward of the summits and the sca well that's what my role models did so i never even really thought about doing anything else of course <laughs> it's just a that's the real me. <laughs> the real me is not the person that goes to work every day. The real me is not, is not the person who goes to court and wears a metal hat. Uh, the real me is a middle class Dutch woman. It's not the fancy stuff. <laughs> so, 
So in that concept of tidal flow of one's life, um, in the SCA, I, uh, for, a, for a long time, we signed the minor waivers for uh, a bunch of kids who grew up later to be um, amazing adults. One of them's name was Angela. Um, so Angela was in high school when we met her and we signed off on minor waivers for her coming to SCA events and she camped with us. And then later I had a, um, a cafe for several years and she was one of my employees at the cafe. And then I had to close the cafe and she uh, started a tea business. And she's now, I think the president of the US or at least the Oregon um, Tea Association. And I am now working for her developing recipes uh, using her tea. Wow. And, and so it's a, a, an almost complete life cycle. Um, but the only reason that I have the the self-confidence to even try this is because the SCA taught me that I can do this. Um, and, and so this is actually a, a, a recipe for, um, I think it's a lavender Earl Grey cheesecake with a lavender Earl Grey caramel and lavender Earl Grey sugar. <laughs> yeah. and it, it's just that thing where I can't separate the SCA from my, from my normal life because it, it is, part and parcel of my normal life. Wow. Aww. That's best in my coat. <laughs> so I remember visiting your house when you were working on that. Uh -huh. Many, like over 20 years ago. And it stuck with me. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I made the coat because I started thinking about stepping down as Baroness and I realized that all of my outerwear belonged to some geographical group. <laughs> so maybe I should make something for myself. Wow. And then, you know, that's one of those things where um, it's, it's very useful for me to live with Raven because I can't draw a stick figure and she barely let, lets me sign my own scrolls because my handwriting is terrible. So I can do things like, um, hold on, let me see if I can get, a part of this where you can sort of see it in the uh, light in here is not so great for this. So that's a sleeve, right? Mm -hmm. And the embroidery goes up and over onto the green part of the sleeve because I'm convinced that embroidery started as a way of reinforcing steams. But um, I, I, I can agree with you. I, I can look at Raven and say, so I want it to be, um, you know, kind of Hungarian and, and like, you know, this shape. Have a pen. <laughs> <laughs> and she draws me lines and I color them in with wool. <laughs> it's very handy. <laughs> I'm still not actually done with that coat. I'm supposed to line it and I've gotten like half the lining in. <laughs> it's, it's a lifetime project. It really is. And you know, boiled wool, it'll out with me. Yep. Um, oh, so one of the things that I love doing at Eggles is the cooking competition. Um, this was just a particularly nicely done um, entry in one of the cooking competitions. So I, I picked it and, you know, I don't even remember who, who won that year. Um, and there were many, many other amazing entries over the years, but, uh, we did, we did this one as, um, sort of a version of, of the, uh, siege cooking idea where you showed up for the, at the beginning of the competition and you were handed a little bag that had a picture of a boat and an explanation on it. And it was like, this is the boat that you are either a trader or a raider or, you know, whatever on, and you're either outbound or inbound because the food would be different on the outbound trip to Mexico versus the inbound trip from Mexico, for instance. Um, and you're expected to trade one item with another trading ship and, you know, that kind of thing. And, Come back with what you cook. Wow. I think that everybody gets different ingredients, um, which is kind of fun. It it makes it a little more interesting for the for the judges. This is so beautiful. It's so well presented. Isn't it? Yeah. Wow. It does does mean that I get to exercise my little research bug because you have to research what food would have been on all those all those boats before you can put it in the bag. Oh, it's incredible. I, Another entry, amazing entry. 
Rotrude. <laughs> so this is almost here because it's just fun history. This is Vesta's sergeantry trials. Mm -hmm. And she built a little model of a Roman encampment in the dirt <laughs> as part of her research paper. <laughs> <laughs> so mostly I'm just, you know, poking it at Vesta and making her blush, but that was a great, that was a great entry. Wow. Uh, ooh, Moroccan food, Moroccan food. Raven and I did a Moroccan feast, I don't know how many years ago, like 25 years ago or something like that. And it was the first one where we explored more than just the food. We did the decorations for it and we researched what scents would have been in the air for a Moroccan feast um, and did that whole nine yards. And it, it got us really started on Moroccan food and more into to some of the non-standard non Western European stuff. Um, and that, of course, meant that we had to collect all the brass trays in the world. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, cue Raven's amazing thrift shopping abilities. Yep. Oh wow. Oh, that's that's more Roman food. I think this one was for the wedding too. And is this Raven's tent back here? Yes. <laughs> Although I I have to to say that it was painted by uh, a woman named Rowan who was introduced to us by Doug and Amy actually, lived in California at the time. I think she just recently moved up to Washington, which is kind of exciting. And of course, because of COVID, we haven't been able to see her or anything, but. Wow. I just, I love making things like this happen for people. It makes me happy. And, and here's, here's a young man who uh, we've watched grow up in the SCA from little tiny. <laughs> it's crazy and you know this is my encampment uh but i don't you know for something like that i don't know three quarters of the people that are at, at the meal because <laughs> <laughs> because they're there for the event that we're hosting and i do love hosting big things in my encampment i like being a hostess i like doing things that will make people's lives happy mm -hmm. oh you know that you can go to the restaurant supply store and buy little Roman flatbreads. Oh, they, are, wow. they are identical. They're street tacos. <laughs> the, the flour tortillas for street tacos, they're identical. <laughs> it's great. Oh, wow. It's probably the only time I have ever served a commercially made bread at, at something like this. But, oh, that's the little charcoal brazier. Super cool. <laughs> you can't really see it, but underneath the brazier, there are these little, um, it's another one of those things where you kind of, you know what should be there and you do your, your version of it. So um, I do make painted tiles. That, that is one thing I can still do in ceramics because it doesn't involve actually manipulating the clay too much. Um, but we didn't have the time or money to do tiles for this event. So I made, um, uh, bisqueware colored um, fabric hot hot pad squares mm -hmm. and we painted the the tile patterns on them <laughs> just to keep the table from getting damaged mm -hmm. yeah wow. there's a hot thing there and if i need to suddenly pick it up i want the hot pad to be right there that makes sense um, but just those little bits of decoration can sometimes really make a difference in the atmosphere of an event so yeah, <laughs> I think, uh, well, I must have still been Baroness because that's the burial cloak. Um, boy, that was a long time ago. It's just another example of, of why I love the SCA, why, why I stay in the SCA is that you can become part of your own fantasy novel, honestly. <laughs> you, know? you get to have this vision of yourself when, you know, when you're like 10 years old and you're lying in bed and you've just read a bunch of folk tales and you think, what would it be like if I was the Russian princess in that story? Well, the SCA lets you do that as much as you want. <laughs> or, or be your own horror movie villain. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the one thing that I'd never done before that we did do uh, during the pandemic was butcher our, our own pig. 
Uh, so Moira and I went in on half a pig and um, I have other much more graphic pictures of it being hauled into the backyard in a wheelbarrow <laughs> with the cat sitting on its head. He thought it was marvelous. <laughs> And, and we, you know, looked up diagrams and, and butchered our own pig, which meant that I had um, a freezer full of meat that I knew exactly where it came from because I, you know, we met the farmer, we knew, knew where it had been raised. Um, I and love that, that a medieval cook would have done that I just had not done yet. So I did not do it in garden. <laughs> so these are um, three of the odd baronesses of Adiantum. So three, five, and seven. Assault was number three, I was number five, and Kate was number seven. Uh, <laughs> and this picture is just a good reminder that you shouldn't be taking everything seriously all the time. You just shouldn't. I mean, when it comes right down to it, I love the SCA. It is obviously part of my life, but it is still a game. If I had to, I, I could not play the game anymore. It would not make me happy. I would be very sad, but don't, don't hurt yourself playing the game. Be silly. Take time to have fun. Yeah. I mean, if, if it's, especially when it's that big of a part of your life, um, we're here to have fun. We're here to live a beautiful, enjoyable life. Yeah. This was my first kingdom peerage meeting. Uh, um, my first peerage meeting, thank goodness, was down in the summits um, when we were still doing combined meetings. And I'm very glad that I had that experience first. Not that the kingdom meeting was bad, but um, it's nice to get your toes wet first, you know? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know, it's a tradition. The baby laurels bring the food. Um, you can tell probably what parts of the food were mine. Um, although I have to say that the Sunny D in that, in that tub was just as popular as my food. <laughs> and of course you know all of all of the people that i knew that were laurels and had you know helped me be recognized as a laurel had sort of sat down ahead of time and said you know for your first meeting or two you probably just want to sit back and observe and see how it goes and not say much yeah that didn't work <laughs> i talked <laughs> i think that there's no problem with talking your first few meetings if you have something to contribute. I don't even remember what I was talking about, but I remember talking. So, you know, these days I, I have to choose my activities in the SCA a little bit. I can't just jump in and do all of the things all of the time. And so I ran a, a competition for preserved foods that year because obviously that's one of my focuses in life. And I want to spread that because it makes it much easier to eat things cheaply and well. Aww. I forgot about this picture. Taking back Morgan's um, sergeant belt so he could be knighted. Aww. We buried him in roses and oh my goodness, did the eyes of the chivalry council get big. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, he may have had the biggest audience participation and reaction of any period peering I've ever seen any period ceremony I've ever seen it was it was very moving it was one of my first the first nightings that I saw um, and being able to participate in something like that I mean just that one day almost makes being Baroness worth it on its own because uh, you just you get to participate in in something like that it's amazing you get a front seat to watching somebody have an amazing day. I really liked being very nice tonight. I, I, I get the feeling. <laughs> so tell me about this tapestry. Okay, so the tapestry. Um, the tapestry is hand spun, hand dyed with period dyes. They researched, well, yeah, the, the people doing the spinning researched what kind of sheep the, the wool should have come from and found them. Um, all of the all of the dyes are period appropriate. Um, it is a commercially woven linen background. The top and bottom bands, however, are hand woven linen and um, they say basically the top of it says uh, 
that it's a presentation from the Barony of Audientum to the Kingdom of the West on the occasion of the 20th or the 30th uh, year celebration of the SCA. And the bottom of it says uh, in Latin, dry clean only. <laughs> uh, because Audientum's like that. Um, <laughs> and, and this literally was made by the Barony of Audientum. Everybody's hands were in yeah. this work. Everybody's hand who was even peripherally involved in the Barony at least drew one line or put in one stitch. It was not optional. <laughs> and what had happened is, is um, when Antir got the bid for 30 year, there were the same number of baronies as there were kingdoms. And so each barony was assigned a kingdom to host. Um, because Adiantum started out as a barony of the West and because geographically we were the closest to the West, um, we asked for the West of, or, and were granted the West as our, as our kingdom to host. And so we started banning about ideas, you know, we weren't really going to need to pick them up at the airport or anything because they were all driving in for the most part. But what could we do? Should we make them a present? You know, what? And it's the idea started out as a painted tapestry and evolved rapidly from there. Um, and was the, the main focus of baronial project nights for about 12 months, maybe a little bit longer. <laughs> um, but mm -hmm. it's, it's still well, well preserved down there. It comes out for their 12 nights. Um, they consulted a, a conservator, I think from Germany or something, how to, how to store it and, and preserve it. Um, but it's definitely one of the you know, it's that group art thing. I, I love group projects and this is why. This is the kind of thing that a group can do when they pull together. One person that would have taken them years to do this. Yeah, yeah. and, and my husband um, talks about, he, he did a few stitches on this and it's something that he still talks about. And I yeah. think, you know, formed who he is in the SDA. Yeah. I mean, I did very little of the physical work on this, but being able to represent a barony that can do a project like this and being able to give this gift to the King of the West and make him cry. Uh, <laughs> you know, once again, that's, you can't get that kind of thing anywhere else. Well, I mean, maybe you can, but it, it forms who you are for the rest of your life after that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> More don't take it seriously. Oh, come to look at it. The, uh, the blonde in the orange um, tunic there mm -hmm. is the one that now owns the tea company. Oh, very cool. <laughs> I don't and, know. And we this, is, this is your family, really. Miklos it's a good yeah. yeah. I mean, I to this day, Miklos and, and Elf would live in Portland, and to this day, I have a toothbrush in their bathroom, and they have my house keys. And I have theirs. Raven obviously has my house because she lives with me. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, Raven and I don't own the house. Um, and, you know, Angela has her own family and kids, but we're obviously in each other's pockets all the time. There's another reason to do art in the SCA right here. Aww. Or anywhere. Anywhere that you can do art, make people happy, get them involved, you know, and teach. Yeah. I mean, I don't have kids. I've never wanted kids, but I borrow other people's kids all the time. It's great. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, it's that's the second step down. Aww. Was this the site that you stepped down at? Mm -hmm. Wow, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Um, I think that's. I want to say that's the one in Cave Junction. Raven will remember better than me. Ra Raven has functioned for my entire adult life as my uh, memory slash sec secretary. You know, <laughs> she remembers names and places and when things happen. And, and oh my God, I don't remember that kind of stuff. I remember probably um, what we had for lunch. And I remember that, um, I remember that Monford Creek Striber likes garlic paste on orange slices. The man hasn't played in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Miklos wants to know about the Biffy incident at 3YC. Boy, you are pulling out all the old ones, aren't you? 
is what you get. Uh, so the Biffy incident at 3YC. Um, Ambrose, I had gotten 10 days off and so had Raven. And we just had a big baronial encampment essentially at, at, at 30 year. Um, so Ambrose had had to go back to Eugene for like three or four days in the middle of the week to work. And we didn't. So <laughs> this involved um, at one point, well, for one, I, I have to, to brag about the clever here. For, in preparation for 30 year, I installed one of those little um, dog lead clips to the back of this huge wide leather belt that I used to wear all the time, partly because it was it's a good back brace so that I could clip the baronial circlet onto it because I've always had this nightmare of losing the baronial circlet down the bippy or something. Anyway, so we had gone off. It was like Tuesday night or something. We had gone to a party at the Rangers and gotten very soused. Um, <laughs> and we were being good. We had drunk water and we were going home. And so we decided we would stop at the Biffies on the way back to the encampment. And we went into the Biffies and I had the baronial circlet clipped to the back of my um, belt because I didn't want to lose it. I knew I was partying that night, yada, yada. And we also, timeline wise, we have to say, I stepped off as Baroness when I was 24. So I was much younger then than I am now. But <laughs> when I came out of the Biffy, it was like some kind of, Catholic experience because I was surrounded, my Biffy was surrounded by a perfect semicircle of every single other landed Baron or Baroness on site. There was a lot of them. Wow. And I look at them and I'm still, you know, kind of halfway drunk and I'm like, what you doing? And they said, we are the landed Barons and Baronesses of the known world and we are feeling up banners. Feeling up banners. And they said, yes, we are going to all of the major banners. And they had this whole thing, like a kingdom, kingdom banner, you went woo, up and down and a principality banner, you did a different thing anyway. So they were going all over site doing this. And I said, I could do that. And they said, we're very sorry, milady, but you would have to be a landed baroness to join our group. And I went, <laughs> so, there was a group of hangers on at the back and, and Raven joined them and I joined the, the landed barons and baronesses of the known world and we went around feeling up banners and there was this semi solemn dinner going on um, with you know a lot of the people that had started the SCA were on site and they were having this dinner and exchanging stories and stuff and we pretty much terrorized those poor people because we went around their tent several times and um, yeah anyway I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, ah, uh, so this would be probably Raven becoming cupbearer, I think. And that's another part of, of playing in that area of the SDA of, of sitting on a seat that's attached to a, a geographical location, um, that you really can't get that feeling doing anything else of recognizing people Ex learning to accept help because you have to and learning to accept that help in public and then recognizing that they saved your butt <laughs> in public later um that's enormously satisfying it's it, you become a court junkie for the rest of your life pretty much <laughs> because you know what those people are experiencing up there and it's amazing and that was klamath falls i think i <laughs> yeah that is the event i ended up with the principality circlet uh, wind burned into my forehead. I had a lot of explaining to do at work after that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is all Eduardo's fault. <laughs> and, and he's actually in the picture, which kind of, kind of cracks me up. But you'll see gripped in my hand there is a little um, horn spoon. Uh, one of my formative moment kind of things. It was during my first reign as princess and we went up to this event. It was a, a May crown, I think, in um, at that site outside of Athol, Idaho. Mm -hmm. The name, I will never get over being in fourth grade on the name of that place, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, he, 
was he was either stepping up as Kingdom Hearts champion or was Kingdom Hearts champion. I don't exactly remember, but he did this um, amazing, like, you know, there's there's clouds and sun in the sky and he was swearing a mighty oath on this big wooden spoon. And I went, that's cool. And so I've sworn fealty on a spoon ever since. <laughs> Sometimes really big, I have a three foot long spoon and sometimes I'm a little bit more subtle. <laughs> now and then. Does the person who's, who, who's back you have the spoon on no? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. <Okay>. So, <laughs> ebb and flow of life, you know, Monday life and the SGA go together. Um, the last few years, I've actually been spending a lot of time at science fiction conventions because I have a business making art out of dead computers. And I started going there to sell things because Ambrose has written, a, at this point, fairly long series of books. And he was going to conventions to sell the books. But we're not really different people necessarily when we go to these. We're just not even necessarily dressed differently. Uh, but I just thought that this was another one of those, because of the SCA, I was able to take this picture. I met Ambrose in the SCA. He's obviously dressed as Ambrose, really, in this picture. His pen name is A.M. Brocius um, for the books that he writes. And, um, and yet it was completely appropriate for R2-D2 to be in the shot. <laughs> I, just, I love that about my life. Hmm. First feast menu ever. Wow. Um, and one of, well, I'm not sure whether it's one of the first, but an early example of Raven's art. <laughs> Making bread. That's English muffins heading for the, heading for the griddle on the fire. Wow. <laughs> what Eggles really does to me. <laughs> So the, the barony made us our own street sign a while back, which we're quite, quite proud of. It's pretty cool. Um, standard lunch at Eggles. It's just one of those experiences, you know, you, you can do this mundanely, you know, you can, you can have a big spread for Thanksgiving, um, that kind of thing. But I love doing this for a group of people that, you know, every Eggles that we have a fairly stable group of 30 or 40 people around us. And we, we only see some of those people every year. And yet it seems like we just saw them last weekend when we get to Eggles because every Eggles is part of the same Eggles. And that just, continuity. Yeah. My family, parts of it. Oh. <laughs> um, looking the other direction in the Eggles kitchen. These are all just experiences that are why for me, why the SCA is, is such a necessary integral part of life. And these bamboo poles are all from your yard, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. And the, the bamboo has a history, because um, we didn't plan it. It was here when we bought the house, but this house uh, was built by Curtis Salgado's family. He's a fairly famous musician. Mm -hmm. and. I can't remember now whether it was his mother or his grandmother planted the bamboo in the 40s and at the time was told bamboo doesn't grow here you're you're crazy uh, obviously it's done fine um and every so often the northwest bamboo society comes through and measures our bamboo and right now as far as i know we still hold the record for the for the biggest diameter of bamboo in the northwest that's amazing ah there's the spoon <laughs> so that that was what inspired me to swear fealty on a spoon forevermore and that, that little horn spoon lives in the pouch that is always on me when I'm at an event so that if I forget, I have a backup. <laughs> We're always prepared. Absolutely. Also, I just really like having horn spoons. Oh, beautiful. This was culinary symposium. And um, for, it's probably the event where I got the most out of just the pure art part of what I do, because they're, you know, there are no metal hats at Kingdom at, at, at Culinary Symposium. Nobody cares. Nobody wants to care. Um, I got to just geek out with other cooks and it was a lot of fun. Um, Isalt and I drove up there together and, and stayed in one of the cabins and 
um, just watching your friends um, grinding grain on a on a stone corn at 11 o'clock at night in your cabin because nobody wants to sleep yet because we're all just having too much fun geeking out and eating. <laughs> Magical. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. And it's a great sight too. Wow. Uh, so all those canned goods. Yeah. It's you know, it's one of those sites where you look at it and go, that's completely not a period site. It's all in glass jars. It's cans. It's not period. And yet it fits in well enough with the SCA that it's okay. Yeah. Oh, borrowing other people's children when I was growing this again. <laughs> I think that particular child is like 20 something now. <laughs> but so this is part of decorating all the things and you can kind of tell that a lot of my formative years, um, Assault was Baroness. And Assault is all about decorating all the things, right? So when I look at pictures of things that are like, this is the quintessential scene in my head, they're always decorated. And in fact, I think some of that, the, the one right behind her might have been one of the early ones right behind me whoever is i think it's me sitting down yeah that's not in the first series i think it's in the second series so at this point that that hanging is over 20 years old but we still use it constantly wow it's amazing how stable a painted bed sheet can be it, it really is when she talked about how she uh you know the the material she uses to make those it's like wow that's so accessible it's so it's accessible it's and it's um, it can be hard, but it's not complex. And there's a difference between difficulty and complexity of projects. Um, oh, this is more in the silly. So the Roman bath at Twelfth Night, um, I wanted to make it possible for me to do for people to do Roman graffiti. Um, so we we stuck up. Uh, I worked in a medical clinic at the time, and there's there's always those big sort of plastic coated posters that are on the walls at medical clinics where the backs of them are white and they make great whiteboards. So I just took a bunch that had been taken down and rolled up and were in the basement at the clinic and put them up on the walls of the bathroom that was attached to the, the bathing room for the Roman bath and people scribbled all over them. I put up a couple like examples to get people started. That's the kind of little stuff that I, I really enjoy inserting into the corners of an experience. If that makes sense. It totally makes sense. It, and yeah, wow. And it helps, I mean, Adiantum has this amazing ability to to decorate a site, but it also helps that we're we're the second oldest barony in Ontario, and we never throw anything away. So, yeah, we have at this point probably probably a hundred hangings with us because we've been making them for forty years. So, just amazing. I I always I feel bad sometimes for for new groups because they'll come to something like Twelfth Night and go, and I, because they've talked to us about it oh my god you know my group could never do something like this and i'm like give it 40 years of course you can you gotta start yeah it's it's like new people coming into the sca and seeing somebody that's been playing 20 or 30 years and mm -hmm. has this elaborate setup and all of these beautiful clothes and it's like yeah I, you know this tunic i'm wearing is 24 years old <laughs> Or like the one I'm wearing right now, which has probably a thousand hours worth of embroidery on it. But, you know, that did not all happen in one year. <laughs> right? It takes time. Yeah, it takes time. I think there's also something to be said for living in certain geographical areas makes some things easier. Oh yeah, so this one first. Um, Raven and I were costumers for Classic Greek Theater up in Portland for several years. Um, the set's not done. This is one of the, the rehearsals, but um, that particular year, the artistic director had the, the chorus being Minoan. This was before actually um, Vesta started doing Minoan, which was kind of funny. So if you look at the heads of those women, and this is another one of those, we got jobs as customers because we have experience as customers in the SCA. So you know, mundane life, SCA life are, are so interwoven, interwoven, interwoven <laughs> um, that you can't really separate them anymore because 
I've gotten almost every job I've ever had because of SCA connections. Not the current one, but that's, I think, the first one in a long time. But anyway, so if you look at their heads and then look at that other picture of me that you just had up. Oh, same. Mm -hmm. So the headdresses were something that we ended up owning at the end of that, um, end of that play. And they're the best cooking headdresses ever. <laughs> You just pass them out to everyone in the kitchen. <laughs> um, yeah. And the only difference between the, the chorus members was the color of the band on the, the blue headdress. So it depends on what apron I'm wearing too. <laughs> Very cool. So I started early. <laughs> <laughs> um, somehow these got out of order. This should have been the first picture in this set, but uh, I am six. In that picture that's that montessori learning no no I, that's no. before we even moved to oregon uh, but clearly i knew what i wanted out of life <laughs> <laughs> you made it happen yeah my you know my relatives have always called me a princess they're not always being um flattering in that description but it's truthful <laughs> what can i say but going back a little bit to um geographic location making some things easier for the SCA too. Um, one of Adi Antum's big advantages is that we have a glass blowing school here in town. Oh, so wow. things like this show up at Goodwill for $1.99. Wow. Um, you know, and which is one of the reasons that Adi Antum has given away so much Roman glass in the last 10 years or so as prizes. <laughs> it's because it's available. <laughs> But, and and you know how to find it. Uh, thrift stores are my jam. <laughs> I go grocery shopping for therapy, and I go to thrift stores instead of Disneyland's. And and I think I think that you and Raven could teach a whole class on thrift shopping for the SCA. Mm. Um, because it, it's it's something Lau taught me when I first started, um, and. We still use uh, all of the rugs in our tent, our thrift shop rugs mm -hmm. um, that were super inexpensive. You know, a, a lot of our utensils, there's so many things that you can find that are, that can be almost like impressively period. Yeah. There, there is nothing non-period about that picture. <laughs> you know, it is, it is a hand-blown Roman reproduction. It's even the right color. And it was a buck 99. I think thrift storing, um, there's a lot of the same attitude to that as, as I have to food. I don't go into food thinking, this is what I want to make for dinner. What do I need to go to the store for? I go to the store with, I need three items of vegetable. I need two items of, of fruit. Uh, it would be nice to have some animal protein and um, something I can make bread out of next month if it's cheap enough. You know, you might have overall I'm going to the thrift store and I need something I can turn into a, a wall hanging for my tent. But you have to look in in fabric and in sheets and in the kids section where the little kids sheets are and, you know, be completely open minded as to what exactly the object is. Um, and if you're making like there's somewhere in one of the, the things I sent you, there's all the painted rugs I made for for Vestas. Um, laureling party and, and vigil, you know, the base for that could be a lot of different things. Um, in that case, it's, it's heavy canvas, <laughs> more painted sheets. Uh, so that's painted canvas, for instance. Um, and they're the, the stepping stones that lead to the Roman bath. And we also use them as the stepping stones that lead to our bathhouse at Eggles. Oh, so for those that have been following along with all of these marvelous um, interviews, and saw is salts when she talked about the stained glass windows being stored in my basement. This is the stained glass windows for the great window and all of that at 12th night um, in my basement, which is about seven feet from where I'm sitting right now, actually. Wow. Just for fun, continuity. Wow. Um, oh, I do paint tiles still. Gorgeous. Sometimes. So, um, 
is Salt makes all of the hand painted, really fancy stained glass windows for um, the Twelfth Night site. I maintain the um, the roll of arms that goes down the the sky bridge, and um, I do smaller ones like these were on the little glass dividers that were in the the restaurant, mm -hmm. and they're they're all illustrations out of medieval herbals. Wow. <laughs> um, painted sheets. Almost everything you're seeing is a painted sheet. This was actually one of the Barony's first really big painting projects after the first series of, um, of the tapestries. We bought this circus tent from a baronial member who was moving to Alaska and didn't want to take the tent with him. And it's to this day what we use for, for the main um, Eggles um, court and, and business tent. But we wanted to make walls um, so that it would be, so that it would have walls uh, and so that it would look a little less like a circus tent. Um, I don't remember where we got the fabric for that. Oh, these <laughs> more of the little hand painted things that, that are part of our Eggles kitchen. That's a knife bag. Um, I use roses and flowers in a lot of my cooking and also as the packaging for um, the computer art business. So when I send out an order of like earrings or whatever, they're, they're packed in, in dried puddles because I have this huge yard and I might as well use it for something. Um, so that's just another one of those tie-ins between my my home life my my hobby life my sca life my you know it's all it's all together i can paint things as long as there's a template <laughs> <laughs> that's about my speed too oh look at those yeah so these are just painted canvas um all of the white lines are done with masking tape on the canvas and and then i just um do an awful lot of spooky, 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 spooky. But they are all um, floor patterns that were found in the archaeological digs for the Palace of Knossos. Mm -hmm. So they were appropriate for her, her vigil and party. I did alter the second, that one that's in the middle. I altered that pattern a little bit because the original floor is swastikas and while I acknowledge that it's a terrible shame that they have been stolen by nasty people, I'm still not putting them on the floor. Yep. Oh, <laughs> these unfortunately are missing. There's two of them. There's this one and there's one that's a blue background with a white um, sea lion. But uh, it's it's an actual Roman um, mosaic that, thank God for Raven and her ability to draw, she was able to add the second tail so that it's an Ontarian sea lion instead of, uh, and these were on the floor at the Roman bath. And that's after hundreds of people <laughs> have wandered around on it wet with muddy feet. <laughs> <laughs> and Which whoever would, borrowed them needs to return them. It would be nice. Yeah, there's the blue one. Wow. It looks actually, to me, it looks a lot more real after it's gotten all muddy, which um, is reminiscent of the story that Lau told of that one skirt that she made where she took it out in the backyard and dumped it in a, in a mud puddle and hopped up and down on top of it because it, it made it into clothing instead of a set piece. And that's the same with these is they start out maybe looking a little bit like a set piece. And then after the first time you wear them or use them, then they're, they're real. Yeah. <laughs> we painted um, tents for Eggles prizes one year. And this was, uh, right after I think the first time Assault and I did a 12th night together in, in modern times, i.e. past the 1980s. <laughs> so it's, it's all that same, um, uh, same patterns that she had, had a lot of embroideries and a lot of her, her hangings that she made for 12th night were this pattern. But we just, we both love the seesaw dogs. In fact, <laughs> come to think of it, the seesaw dogs are what's on my sleeve. Here, let me, let me, uh, <laughs> that we, there they are. Yep. Pretty cool. So. Pretty cool. All right. I'm really into decorating things. I, I, it, it doesn't, I mean, it takes time and it takes effort and I'm not saying that it's something that you can just dash off in five minutes or anything, but it's so worth it. 
it's so worth it to be surrounded by things that are beautiful instead of just functional. And yeah. I want to do both. You know, this this is this wall behind me is is the the bottom of the fireplace to this house. So it's a very functional wall, but I can also make it pretty. Why not? It's just amazing. <laughs> okay. So um I'm a little sillier in my decorations sometimes than a salt is. Uh, these are medical grade coolers that I carved and painted to look like the, the little Roman altars that are all along Hadrian's wall. Um, and I had, a, I had a grand amount of time doing them. I still have a ton of coolers I should get rid of. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I worked in a clinic at the time and we got you know two or three of these a week with, with drug shipments in them for um, injectables and stuff. It had to be cold. So the walls of the sucker, they're like three or four inches thick. Um, I usually take one full of dry ice to Eggleton. I got dry ice still on Monday. Amazing. They're great. <laughs> um, not the most recent 12th night, but the 12th night before, we decided to make the site tokens be a copy of these little intaglio um, uh, ring boss rings. Mm -hmm. dug up in bath so there was one dug up in bath that was this exact picture but um with one tail so of course being on tour we had to add another tail and once again you know yeah i cast 1300 of these things but only because raven could could carve me the um original mold because <laughs> i wouldn't have been able to do that part so uh, what what was the material um that was me learning to use casting resin very cool. Which, of course, being me, I decided, sure, I can do that. Never done it before, but what the heck, let's make 1,300 of them. <laughs> I made 12 site tokens a day for a year. Wow. Because <laughs> some, some days, of course, I missed, and some days half of them didn't come out or whatever. Oh, there, here's the, the hot pads. It's really simple. It's a, it's a simple thing. They're um, fabric ink pens um, and a, a plastic um, template for uh, quilting because I can't draw like I mentioned but it's a simple very cheap way of just spiffing your gear up a little bit wow. plus it's easy and cheap enough that when you invariably burn one um, it's okay not a big deal <laughs> Something to be said for things that you don't cry over when they die. <laughs> Definitely. Um, was that all the pictures? Did I miss a file or is that it? I don't think that's all of them. <laughs> I know I sent you way too many pictures. But... <laughs> no, I, I think um, pictures are a really great way to tell a story. And um, I think that there are a lot of people that are visual learners and processors. And I think that pictures are really useful for that. And it's easier to talk about experiences if you have something to refer to, I think, you know, just me sitting here in front of a wall saying, yeah, courts are really amazing from this side of the of the chair is <laughs> is different from having a picture of why court is amazing from that side of the chair. For sure, for sure. So um, one thing that we haven't talked about. Um, there's a couple of things. <laughs> um, I am blanking on this kingdom award that you have. It's not a lion of Ontier, but it's like. I have a list, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sleep, 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 sorry. Sleep is good, sleep is good. Uh, which one are you thinking of? Let's see. The lion's strength. Oh yeah. Okay. That's your most recent recognition. I think so. Maybe I'm, maybe, I don't know. Anyway. There was another grail after that. Oh, was there? I, I think it's a really cool award. I do too. And, and I'm kind of, I'm a little gobsmacked that I got it. Um, cause, cause I don't think of myself that way, I guess. Well, I think a lot of us do. 
not quite sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Uh, I, I, hopefully, I've mostly been a force for good. Um, but yeah, I just, I just do things because it makes sense at the time, or because I want to, or because assault talks me into it, or uh, because because it makes me or people happy. It's 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 very odd to think of myself as as being somebody who could get that. But I, I was very flattered when I got it. Good. Um, so the pandemic has kind of disrupted your cycle. Oh my God. <laughs> how are you? How, what is your plan to do you have a strategy to get back at it? Well, a lot of what I've done actually is just reduce the quantity of my normal cycle. So I'm hoping that it won't be a huge jarring re-entry process, but you know, I won't really know till it happens. And it's, it's gonna happen quickly because um, on the non-SCA side, I've got Rose City Comic Con and Emerald City Comic Con and Geekcraft all scheduled and I sell at all of those. Um, and I actually have just as much junk that has to be loaded in for that as I do for, for an SCA event. But, um, and, and that has slowly been worked into that um, title nature of my life, you know, in, in the in the fall and winter, I, I'm selling more. And then in the, in the summer after Eggles, I'm making more product and that kind of stuff. Um, partly because tearing the computers apart is much better done outside. And I don't like doing that when it's cold, I'm a wuss. Um, for Eggles, it's so hard for me to believe that it hasn't happened. I mean, it's, it's Last year, I, I had the first year since I was 15 years old that Eggles was not, that my birthday was not packing a truck for Eggles. And I had no idea what to do with it. Plus, I couldn't hang out with anybody anyway. So <laughs> it didn't really happen. I suspect the way my brain works with, you know, all Eggles are the same Eggles and all 12th nights are the same 12th night, um, that I'll get to the first Eggles that we can have in person and I won't really acknowledge the difference until it's over. I'm not sure. Yeah. Hopefully you can just slide back into it. Yeah, I really, I didn't stop doing any of the things that I do and that's because it's also wrapped up in my mundane life. You know, I'm not gonna stop canning. I just didn't maybe can quite so much. Um, and I still have a lot of the stuff that I had prepped for that first cycles that we had to cancel. So, you know, this last year, I, I only did about 30 pounds of quinces instead of, you know, 150. Um, still managed to somehow be very busy all year. I'm still trying to, trying to figure that out. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I think what happened really was just that my, my tidal cycle didn't, it didn't really stop. It just, um, it got smaller and uh, the beach went away. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. It's like the, the little things in my life, you know, I still get up in the morning and get on the bus and go to work every day. And that has not stopped through the whole pandemic. Um, so the little things have stayed the same, but the big things have altered or stopped radically. And uh, I doubt that I will know really how I handle them starting again until it happens. Right. But I know yeah. what it's Oh my God, that's one of the big differences. There, half of my freezer is empty. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> Super weird. Super, Super weird. Wow. Well, <clears throat> is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we haven't talked about yet? Oh God. Um, I, I, you, you know, I get your list. <laughs> oh, I didn't really write a list. I, I printed out the award list just because I knew somebody was going to ask me dates or something. And, and I don't remember that kind of stuff very well. And I printed out that one Facebook post that got you started. <laughs> oh, <laughs> just in case um, I needed to refer to it or, or something. I, you know, I'll think of something the minute that we stop, but <laughs> <laughs> I hate talking about myself. So <laughs> Despite the of, um, chin flapping I've done tonight, you're good at getting me started. 
Is there anything else you wanted to ask? Um, I, I'd like to ask you about your sergeants and what, what it's been like to, to foster. I think that the sergeants uh, kind of program in, in Ontier um, is kind of unique and it's really awesome the way that it trains people up. I loved having sergeants. That was so much fun. And I have to admit, I've never really stopped. A lot of, a lot of the people who are my sergeants still function that way in my life, um, which is wonderful. Well, let's start with some philosophy. To me, all of the peerages are about an art form. You may have your peerage in a martial art form. Your, your art form may be service, which is an amazing art form. Your art form may be stained glass. Your art form may be cooking. Um, your art form may be leadership or inspiration. And all of those art forms have some type of student and sergeants are, are one of those types of students. Um, just like any other, you know, if I take an apprentice as a Laurel, if I take a sergeant as a, a Baroness or took a sergeant as a Baroness, it's a very close relationship to me. You are, you are saying that you are the conduit between, um, between them and the crown, between them and anyone else that you think that they need to, to learn from um you are uh not quite but almost inviting them into your family um even when they don't always get along with each other <laughs> uh and in turn they are giving you an enormous amount of trust and you have to hold that trust well um I really, I really enjoyed having sergeants because one of the things that I felt very deeply when I stepped up as Baroness, especially, is, you know, this was before we had a principality and getting people down here recognized or hooked up with, you know, the, the expert in the art that they're really into that happens to live in, you know, Canada or something was significantly more difficult. There was no um, internet. There was none of this Zoom thing, <laughs> which I love. There was no Facebook. We're talking the dark ages here. Uh, <laughs> and so it was really the job of, of the Baroness to, to be the Facebook, to be the, the conduit for, for those people. Um, and I, I, I'm an enabler at heart. I, I loved being able to to do things to make their lives easier or better or more fun or more educational or whatever. And it was an enormous learning process for me too, because I had to learn to let other people serve and help me. And um, thank God for Amanda Kendall and her lack of pulling punches. I learned to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, every Baroness sort of has their own style of sergeantry trials. What were yours like? Mine were um, partly necessitated by the fact that at that time, Salem was, I think when I stepped up, they weren't even a Shire yet. No, that's not true. They were a Shire because they, <laughs> I went to some of their Shire events when I was still in college right before I stepped up, but, um, and they weren't part of summits. So uh, Adiantum, when I stepped up as Baroness, the Baron and Baroness of Adiantum were the only people in Southern Oregon that could, that could open a court. Um, I don't, we didn't even have any dukes or duchesses at that point down here. Um, so we pulled sergeantry from all of Southern Oregon as well. So the, um, the trials had to be in some ways a little more brutal than a lot of places where, you know, some baronies run classes all year and you take a, a test at the end of that class and then you go on to the next class. In Adiantum, sergeantry trials one day there are no classes ahead of time unless you ask for them. Um, and a lot of what I was testing for was independence of thought. Um, especially when I stepped up and you could not do your research online. They needed to be people that, that were comfortable calling me on the phone and saying, look, I'm trying to do research on this thing and I live in Klamath Falls and I, can't, I have no access to this information. Can you help me get this information? Um, they needed to be people who would look around and see that something needed to be done and do it on their own. I, I had 
the modern term would be spoons. I had no spoons for people that wanted to or needed to be hand led through everything. There are other places for people that need that. Um, but Sergeant Tree to me was not one of those because one of the things that you're saying is Baroness when you when you give someone the Sergeant Tree belt is that they are ready for period in all but the expertise in their chosen art. Um, so you're swearing that they've got the PLQs, you just, they just need to work on their fighting or their, you know, their sewing or whatever. Um, and I, I don't want to break people by putting them in a position that they're not ready for yet. So yeah, there's a lot of, um, you need to be, you need to be someone independent to be one of my sergeants. Um, and, you know, my sergeants would get together with other sergeants and they would both look at each other's thing and go, oh my God, how did you survive that? You know, the ones from the, the, the ones that do a class every, every month would be like, oh, in one day, did you have to memorize it all? <laughs> and then mine would be looking at them going, you take classes for a year? <laughs> you know? So, um, but the end result is the same. You have a group of people that are dedicated to the service of the barony and are amazing people and become the next generation of leaders. For sure, for sure. Um, you'll have to read the comments. Uh, I'm sorry that I, I, I probably could have figured out some way to screen share them or something, okay. but um, you'll have to go back and read the comments because there's a lot of love being thrown your way. <laughs> a lot of your family is uh <laughs> loud <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's wonderful i've always um admired the community that you have built and maintained for how many years have you been going to eagles I was um, 16 at my first one, and I'm turning 52 on Thursday. So, a lot. A lot. <laughs> but I also, you know, I, I think maybe that's a little bit too much credit to me because I, I joined a household that was already formed and followed in the footsteps of many people. Right. Um, I, you know, thank God Amanda Kendall took me under her wing when I was a baby baroness because I was the youngest landed landed baronial that the known world had ever seen at that point. And I think there's only one or two now that have been younger than me at the time. Um, and, and it didn't break you. It didn't break me. I loved that job. And um, in many ways, I wish I could go back to it. Very various things, both in and out of the SCA have changed so that it, it's the job is not the same as it was when I had it. And I think I would I'm less suited to, to what the job description is now than I was to what the job description was then. But, um, you know, don't get me wrong. I loved being princess, but Baroness felt like me. I loved it. That's awesome. That's awesome. But the Barony wasn't bad either. <laughs> <laughs> well, we haven't talked about um, what transitioning to a principality was like there's so many things that we could talk about oh, but, yeah. but we're into two and a half hours um, <laughs> and then i was afraid i wouldn't be able to say anything <laughs> 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 we, should, we should probably call it call it an activity soon or people are going to go to sleep <laughs> well i really appreciate being able to chat with you it's been a total honor thank you for doing this and helping me remember why i do the sga um uh, what, it's easy to forget sometimes when you get wrapped up in in a new job that's eating your brain and you don't have any energy for that kind of you know doing anything extra yeah it's, it's easy to forget how much mental and physical energy it gives you to just you know get off your butt and do it well thank you for sharing your journey and um your incredible process it's just um wow <laughs> Well, thank you for being an amazing uh, interviewer and relaxing me enough to actually remember my own name. Hey. <laughs> um, tomorrow, my sister and I are interviewing um, Sir Justin De Leon. He uh, started out in the Outlands. He's a Knight of Ontario and uh, he's very active in uh, 
<clears throat> on two years DEI Council. So uh, we'll talk to him about his journey and uh, about the work that he's doing and has been doing throughout the pandemic. So thanks everyone for watching tonight. Um, thank you again, Marianne, so much. Uh, such a pleasure. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow and good night. <laughs>